12 structured lectures. At the end of it, we expect that all of you are skilled enough to deal with every child with clubfoot. Okay? Especially the idiopathic clubfoot. The syndromic ones may take a little while of experience and understanding before you deal with them. Yeah. So first of all, we have very basic concepts on clubfoot. Then we go on to the advanced concepts. The basics. Congenital talipus equinovirus. It's a deformity which is present from birth. As a postgraduate, when the examiner asks you, yes, doctor, what is it? Sir, it is a case of congenital talipus equinovirus. Why do you say so? What is it? Then why is it? Sir, it is present from birth. Okay. There's no other associated problems. What do you mean by that? No other associated congenital anomalies which would mark it as a syndromic So you say, sir, it is a case of idiopathic clubfoot. Hmm? So to say that, no other associated congenital anomalies are there. Okay? And why would you look for that and how would you look for that? You want to make sure that you have not missed out all those conditions which can cause a deformity like clubfoot. So, Primarily, clubfoot is a problem. Secondarily, you can acquire it because of neurological conditions, because of, you know, Charcot-Marie disease, cerebral palsy, paralytic poliomyelitis, other paralytic conditions can also contribute. So those come in the domain of secondary clubfoot. There's a group which comes part of syndromic clubfoot. They have associated syndromes. So there we look at all the associated anomalies in a child. So you have to do a head-to-toe -to -toe examination. So your job as the first person assessing the child is to be sure that it is an idiopathic clubfoot. So once you write on top of the OPD card, top of your diagnostic criteria, idiopathic clubfoot, be sure you are not missed any of those. So your job as a primary assessor, I have had children coming to me at age 21, diagnosed as cerebral palsy, I assess, first look, I say it's not cerebral palsy. And the father was aghast. I said, Dr. Sab, all my life I have been told it is this. He said, no, it's not this. So somebody who put it as CP went on and on. Somebody who put it as idiopathic club foot keeps getting repeated. We can copy it. Don't make that mistake. Reassess, if you're seeing the child for the first time, reassess the child head to toe. A head to toe examination. And that has to be done very carefully. So, you need to be sure that you're not dealing with a uh, syndromic club foot. Now, the current understanding after the genome sequencing has been done is hugely different now. For every condition, they are finding patterns. So those of you who are interested in the references, it is there. One name which you'll find repeatedly in genetic studies is Matthew Dobbs. Matthew Dobbs, he has been frequently appearing in papers because the research work is being done. He was in Washington University, St. Louis, moved from there to now Florida. Um, he's working there. Many papers. We have now identified the transcriptional pathways that help us understand a clubfoot evolution. So if you look at the organogenesis of different body structures, uh, the limbs are developed by 12 weeks. You have the fetus there and you can diagnose clubfoot by 14 to 16 weeks. So an ultrasound done in 14 to 16 weeks you can find the pathways. So all the transcriptional and all those pathways have already done their job and created the foot that is club foot or that is normal foot. It has already happened. Okay. This seems to go back. 
they mm. also have identified some levels in some chromosomes 12q for example where there is an anomaly which leads to a club foot as a deformity so there is a chromosome but that's only they've been found in, in a small percentage of cases not all of them so you can't say that this chromosome is responsible for this because <laughs> remember there are different syndromes with different chromosomes being affected deletions in certain levels in certain chromosomes which lead to a combination of deformities and club foot may be part of it only 25 percent of these cases it is familial only 25 percent others there may be no family history so we don't know so we don't know the heritability of this we don't know the extent of heritability all we know is that if there is a family history yes there is a higher probability so always take a family history when you're taking the history so your job is to find out is this case from birth or later on acquired or from birth if it is from birth is there any sibling with the same problem simple that's two things that you have to be clear the incidence varies widely now you had have learned in your community medicine what is the difference between incidence and prevalence prevalence is at a point in time you look at it but the total incidence you will have to do a population study all the newborn babies in that community how many have the problem that's difficult to do how can you look at all the children in the community major study house to house survey every child being examined assessed idiopathic non idiopathic what is it you have to assess so that assessment is difficult so guesstimates of global incidence vary from 0.6 to 8 per thousand live births. If a thousand live births are there, out of them, maybe 2,000 babies born, one child will be clubfoot. The another estimate, 1,000 babies born, one child has clubfoot. That's a wide variation. But then there's also 8 in that figure there. How did that come about? Let's go back into history. One of the earliest, pap earliest papers on the community studies was Ruth Wine Davies in the 50 late 50s she did a study at the exeter county in in england and came out with an incidence which is close to one per thousand live births house to a survey in that county one per thousand live births the next paper that you'll find 60s nothing 70s nothing 80s there is a paper which talks about the maori population are you familiar with the maoris those that follow cartoon would know it very clearly Maoris, Maori is a tribe in the Pacific Islands, Polynesian Islands. And what is peculiar about islands? Small population which is isolated with many consanguineous marriages. Which means genetic anomalies can pool together contributing a higher incidence of genetic abnormalities, higher incidence of birth defects. So consanguineous marriages lead to a higher incidence of genetic anomalies so in these pollination islands the incidence varied from 8 to a 15 per thousand live births so out of thousand live births eight babies could have club that's a huge incidence that's where the variation okay and there has been a recent study which looked at recent study which looked at sweden for example 2019 there's a paper which looked at incidence of club foot in sweden and how are Swedish, you've heard of uh, registries, isn't it? Registry means you have a documentation of every case being done in that particular region. The Swedish registry in many things is the most robust. Do you know why? We have Aadhaar card now. A lot of things are being done linked to Aadhaar card, KYC, Aadhaar card linked. Sweden had this, everything in the state was linked to a social security number. Whether you are in the south of Sweden in Gothenburg or Jotabari as they call it or up there in Uppsala, north of Sweden, you go to any hospital, your access is through one number, one social security number. So when you go there in Swedish hospital, they would know married, unmarried, what is your age, what are your siblings, what is your occupation, where are you working how many disease episodes you have had, 
whether you had congenital birth defect or not, whether you're alcoholic or not, whether there any admission with alcoholism, every detail is there. So Swedish registries for arthroplasty were the earliest. They are very robust. They are very robust. So this group, they did a study on all the hospitals in Sweden, how many have been diagnosed with clubfoot. And they came up with an incidence of 1.24 per thousand live births. That's also very close, 1.24 per thousand live births. I'm telling this because it's not easy to do population studies, it's difficult. And the numbers have been around one only globally. Now, if you look at estimates on the total population, about 200,000 newborn babies born with clubfoot worldwide. In India, it is estimated, some people say 50,000 per thousand life per, per year. Some people say 40,000, some people say 35,000 newborn babies with clubfoot born in India annually. That's a large number. Global is 200,000. India guesstimate is, let's keep it a middle path regime since this is Dr. Tuli's domain. Uh, middle path regime, 40,000 live clubfoot babies every year in India. 40,000 is a very large number. Out of 200,000, if 40,000 from India, what is the rest of Asia? China is there, large population. Indonesia is there, large population. Pakistan, Bangladesh, all these countries together have only a small number. We don't know what is the truth there. But the fact remains, Indian figures are high, Chinese figures are definitely lower. 40% are bilateral. And I already told about the ultrasound diagnosis, that's the way picture is. By 16th week ultrasound, you can by and large consistently diagnose clubfoot, which is seen even at birth. There are studies on this. And the numbers in North Europe, in, in Europe and North America, very small, very small. But Asia, the numbers are high. China, we really do not know why the figures are low. Uh, we've spoken to some doctors who worked in China. And they said, we actually see less number of children with clubfoot in China. Uh, probably we can believe, they say that you, know, you can't believe these figures. No, probably you can believe them because in China, foot is a major fetish for beauty. Uh, if you look at history, historically, girl children in China were binded up in tight bandages on their feet. Because in China, it is considered a state of beauty if you have small feet, delicate feet. Women are supposed to have small, delicate feet. It's a sign of their beauty. They are more beautiful. Like in Myanmar, you have necks have to be long to be beautiful. Surahidar gardan, as they say in Hindi. It have to be a long neck to be beautiful. So they used to have these rings around their necks to make their necks longer. So their feet would bind bound in tight bandages to make them small. So, foot is an important concept of beauty, part of beauty and beauty culture in China. Therefore, it's unlikely that figures are wrong. They actually probably have less number of club feet. Um, I already told you about the Swedish study. The reference is there. Um, it is 2021 published paper, but 2019 study. Our own data. The RBSK data. RBSK data, uh, this is a um, report from the RBSK, Ministry of Health slide, when they had surveyed 42 million children around India. It's a huge number. 42 million children were surveyed and they found the most common birth defect among them, congenital heart disease. The most common birth defect was congenital heart disease. After that, 13%, which was the next uh, common one, neural tube defect. So sad. Neural tube defect is a preventable condition. You know how do you prevent it? Anyone? How do you prevent neural tube defect? When do you give it? When do you give it? Folic acid. Anyone? Louder.
preconception that's important that's very good it's a preconception why it has to be given preconception because when you look at organogenesis neural tube when does it form the first structure to form in the body is the neural tube the ectodermal folds that form very early on by the time pregnancy is diagnosed you probably are going into that stage when neural tube is beginning to form within 4 weeks you have the neural tube formation happening and it's too late by the time diagnosis is made is too late in 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 us and europe we, the incidence of neural tube defects have dramatically come down whereas it's still high here 13% of birth defects in india belong to neural tube defects and secondary clubfoot from neural tube defect is common in india even today so we need to look at that the next common are cleft lip and cleft palate and the next common is club foot so club foot com comes out to be the most common musculoskeletal birth defect that you and i deal with on a day to day basis that is what we have the the neural tube defect go to the neurosurgeons and many of those kids do not survive so that's why you don't see as many as club foot children because they survive they are there they are there for you to see so we need to recognize this then the next question should we screen a child born with club foot and coming to you should we screen every child send it for ultrasonography of the hip well there have been studies on this an american study which looked at it they screened every child born with club foot for ddh screening the ddh screening can be clinical screening which is the otolonies test which is a relocation test the balos modification of the otolonies test uh, which is a provocation test you give us stress and bring it back in fact when i was talking to thadis longo uh, from burn he is the one who is part of the gans group for safe surgical dislocation he said no we do not allow surgeons in switzerland to do the balos modification why we are making a located hip dislocatable so we don't do that we only do the otolonies test and the telltale marks for ddh we check for clinically and what are they abnormal crease additional crease and a restricted abduction are they reliable not very if it is bilateral more reliable if it is unilateral we can pick uh, alaric's wisdom on these things later on but this is what it is so the understanding in the us study was that additional ddh ultrasonographic screening is not needed if you are seeing an idiopathic club foot but if it is syndromic maybe you need it but idiopathic you don't need it study by dr grisha madhuri in south india there is a slightly higher prevalence of ddh in children with club foot so be careful assess them very carefully clinically and if there is any doubt at 6 weeks please do an ultrasonography that's a report from india is there any other paper alaric on this i am not aware brisha has done a community based study because they have the north arcot um, community reach program where they did the the study and they found this uh, to be true slightly higher prevalence as compared to the american study so important thing is we need to look at every child very carefully before we diagnose it as simple idiopathic club foot okay then there's a whole consequence from that's why we are all here we are all because we want to make sure that no child born with club foot has a disability from club foot that's the goal for that we need to recognize it early and take them on for treatment because we do not want the stigma of club foot sticking on any child or their family so we do not want the handicap coming from the disability and we do not want the social consequences of club foot in these children however remember we do not like the term neglected neglected club foot term is not recommended even by who in the 90s the who came out with this whole concept of do not use the term neglect for any medical condition no neglect word to be used for any medical condition why because the word neglect goes with the connotation of blame who neglected who neglected the mother the father the mother in law or 
may be the pediatrician or the obstetrician or the health secretary or the health minister or the chief minister or the prime minister where does the buck stop we are not into the blame game we are into the game of looking at what can we do for that problem therefore we do not encourage the use of neglect for any medical condition we only encourage the term untreated condition no use of neglect because we are not into the blame game we are into the correction and not into blame at all that's what we have to remember the options for clubfoot treatment have varied widely uh, the pendulum as alaric mentioned has swung back and forth early kite treatment was historically the method the consequences of this many went in for failure of treatment and therefore needed surgery then in the 70s surgery became popular extensive surgeries post tro medial soft tissue release very complex surgeries fascinating to do it so when i was a post graduate your age my teacher dr sita gupta was one of the few lady orthopedic surgeons who was very good in soft tissue surgeries run the ran the club foot clinic and my my second year senior pg thesis was early postero medial soft tissue release in club foot treatment and what was the early age 6 weeks because turco's recommendation is if a club foot child is not collected in two or three cast start soon after birth and in two or three cast correction has not happened take up the child first and you should be two weekly cast so if you start treatment in two weeks of after birth two casts given no correction take up for postomeral soft tissue release so by 6 weeks as the early corrective surgery that was done huge dissection that is required in these cases to do the correction so you lay open the whole foot and then close it and correct it beautifully it looks beautiful it's, it's incredible even today i can do it i learned how to do it and i can do it i lay open the foot and put it back and looks fascinating parents are impressed doctor aap aap to bhagwan ne kamal kar diya because pura nice it looks i moved from molana azad medical college to my present hospital and 5 years down the line one mother came to me the foot had a scar of pmstr the foot looked deformed again so young enthusiastic surgeon aggressive surgeon is kisne kara tha operation who operated so she looked at me and said doctor sahab aap hi ne kara tha that is a wake up call for me and i knew i would have done the correct surgery and i would have done the full correction fully corrected foot would have gone i asked her pura theek nahi hua no bilkul theek tha sir doctor sahab ye bhi dheere dheere wapas chala exactly as alaric mentioned any tissue which is cut in the body heals by forming scar tissue scar tissue is collagen collagen when it matures over a period of time it shrinks and when it shrinks it does not keep pace with that collagen does not keep pace with the growth of skeletal tissue the only tissue in the body which heals by forming the same tissue is bone bone heals by forming bone every other tissue whether it is muscle tendon skin whatever you have heals by forming scar tissue collagen tissue which shrinks with time therefore surgery leads to scarring and scarring leads to shrinkage shrinkage leads to failure to keep pace with skeletal growth and therefore recurrence of deformity early results are excellent but late results are terrible so you can have surgery good correction good results very happy but no long term results are not good poncity the long term results are good so the pendulum swung from pmstr to elizarov and other distraction techniques but today the gold standard is poncity's method because the long term results are the best unfortunately it did not become popular 1946 Poncetti's method was there, but did not get taken up by the rest of the world. 1946.
But you look at papers by Ignacio Ponsetti in the 40s, nothing. 50s, nothing. There are papers by him on DDH, there are papers by him on Perthes, there are papers by him on scoliosis, but nothing by him on clubfoot. The first article by him come up in 1962. 1962, 63. But does the world take it up? No, it doesn't. Forgotten. We don't know what happened. It was a conservative method, it had a tenotomy there, nobody took it up. Because the technique has a detail to it, which people did not understand. They never understood the kinematics of what Ponsetti was talking about. So, the God is in the detail, they say, or maybe the devil is in the detail. We say the God is in the detail. That detail, if you don't follow carefully, your results are not good. That's why we are here. We are here to help you with the details of Ponsetti's method so that you get the right gold standard, correct method all the time. The technique became popular not because of doctors. The technique became popular not because of the surgeons pushing for it in workshops like this, no. It became popular because of parental pressure. And parental pressure became popular from social media and the internet. It only became popular in the 90s. In the 90s, there was a lead article which talked about 30 year follow up, 95, but the popularity actually surged only with parental groups pushing for the treatment by Ponsetti's mother. I'll give you a story before I close this. Uh, the vice president of Apple Corporation, obviously she has to be savvy on the net. Vice president had a baby boy born with clubfoot. She went to a leading orthopedic surgeon, pediatric orthopedic surgeon in New York City and asked him, doctor, can you do something for this? He looked at it, examined it, it was idiopathic clubfoot, no other syndrome. Yes, I can correct it. How will you do it? Normally we do casting, but in more than 50% of the cases we need to do a surgery. So will my child surgery? Need surgery? Yes, in all probability he'll need surgery. Oh, don't you do the Ponsetti's method? He said, no. What is that? You don't know about the Ponsetti's method? No. Okay, don't touch my child until you go and learn Ponsetti's method. Surgeon was a leading pediatric orthopedic surgeon. He was shocked. How can you be so arrogant that you are telling me to go and learn before you touch my child? But she was a senior influential person, vice president of Apple Corporation and very later on went to become CEO of Armani. You know, the Armani fashion designer group. She had the audacity to say that because she knew that the social media showed parents talking to each other that my child had club foot, looks normal foot now because I went to Pond City. And that is how the pressures on people to take on Pond City's method started. And we now know it is the gold standard for treatment. It is the gold standard because it is the most effective method of treating these children. Most effective method. It is an efficient method. With minimum intervention, you can correct it. That's why it's an efficient method. It is easy to do. It doesn't need high tech. It doesn't need robotic surgery. It doesn't need special equipment. It's very easy to implement. And it is incidental that is economical. We are not pushing it because it is economical. No. Because people have this concept that, you know, even politicians try to sell you that, oh, this is the best, most advanced state of the art. But the state of the art need not be complex, robotic, advanced technology. It is simple plaster technique which can correct a foot to become normal for a lifetime. It is incidental that is economical. That's why we are pushing it. The most efficient, effective method, that's why we are pushing it. It's also there. We continued our clinics even during the COVID time. We sanitized the Macintosh. On this very Macintosh, 
at the height of delta wave, we had syndromic club for children needing surgeries coming there. I have examined children on this very mat, Macintosh, screaming, no mask. All I had was my white coat and mask. Child needed surgery, a limited surgery, sent for PAC. Requirement was RT-PCR essential before anesthesia was to be given. The child was positive. Three kids on this very examination couch. I was certain I will become positive, but luckily I did not get the disease and I survived. Or maybe I had asymptomatic disease, I do not know. But I didn't get it, fortunately. But that's it. We can continue it with our initiative. So what you are going through has been uh, you will you will go through a set of structured lectures prepared by international experts and Indian experts. So what you are going through is a structured training program. Ten structured lectures to start with. Two more have been added later on, and we will take you through all of them between the two of us. Uh, thank you very much.